Would it be better for the 76ers to keep or trade James Harden? You know what? I think they should keep him. Matter of fact, I know they should keep him. Long as he's going to buy into being the James Harden they need him to be. Last year, the two-man game between him and Joel Embiid in the pick and roll was beautiful to watch when James Harden wanted to buy in actually being the point guard. Now, you bring in Nick Nurse, who I believe is a hell of a coach who's going to get more out of Tyreek's maxi. And then you got to ask yourself, what do James Harden want? I mean, he turned down a two-year, hundred-plus million dollar extension when he was in Houston to get traded to the Brooklyn Nets, and I believe he he, he turned down a three-year, hundred and fifty-plus million dollar extension with the Brooklyn Nets before he was traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. So if you if you're James Harden, you got to ask yourself, what is it that I'm searching for? And in my eyes, from the outside looking in, he got to be wanting the championship. Okay, we just talked about the Eastern Conference for us being wide open. And me and Wendy went on here and we talked about the Milwaukee Bucks being the favorite. But if James Harden stay, you know, all of a sudden, the next to them is, is the Philadelphia 76ers in my eyes. I love the addition of Nick Nurse, but if I'm Philly, I would keep James Harden. I would keep him. I wouldn't even worry about trading him. I would keep him. I agree with you perk that the best path for him if he wants to contend he should stay in Philadelphia we know what happened in game six and game seven against Boston if he wants to redeem himself this is the perfect place to do it playing in a place where you just led the league and assist you have the reigning MVP by your side but if he was so unhappy about the way that contract negotiations went that he decided to opt in and further his, further limit his leverage, then you might have a James Harden that we've seen time and again when he's not happy about something, he might not be bought in. So I think there's a big if about getting back to the James Harden or however you phrased it, like being that guy that he that the Philadelphia 76ers need him to be. When he was unhappy in 2020 in Houston, instead of showing up for training camp, we saw Instagram, Twitter of him out with Lil Baby not going to training camp. In 2022, when he was unhappy with the situation in Brooklyn, it's, oh, man, my hamstring hurts and I may have to sit out. And then all of a sudden, that magically went away when he ended up getting to Philadelphia. I think you run into a risk here knowing that he, when he's disgruntled, when he's not in a happy situation or where he feels he's valued – He's not going to be putting the work first to get himself in a better situation. The only difference here is that he's on an expiring contract. It's not like he's in the middle of some long-term deal. He's got to prove this season that he's worthy of the next big deal because he did take the pay cut last year. Maybe he's feeling a little slighted that the years didn't end up lining up with what Philly had on the table. They were the only team that could have offered him the four-year $213 million max that didn't get close to that. So... I think the best thing to do, if you can get Damian Lillard, if you can find somebody else to be the primary ball handler there, you know, along with Tyrese Maxey in your backcourt, is find a place, whether it's Los Angeles Clippers, whether it's somewhere else, for James Harden, and then get those trade assets back and go all in on Damian Lillard or try to find somebody else that can be an upgrade because Philly doesn't have time to waste. Their window with Joel Embiid is right now. He's a big man. His career arc for you know, for bigs, that's it's shorter, and he and he realizes that too, coming off of his MVP season, that they've got to continue this progression in the Eastern Conference right now, not wait a year to do it. Yeah, I think something worth uh, remembering here is he gets lost in everything with all the trades and uh, all the speculation. It wasn't like the Sixers didn't want James Harden back. They did want him back. They just were going to play hardball in the negotiations. They didn't want to give him a four-year max contract. Um, we saw that the Mavericks, you know, weren't willing to give Kyrie Irving a max contract because they knew that there weren't any offers out there in that regard, and there weren't for Harden either. Um, and the difference between when he asked out in Houston and when he asked out in Brooklyn is that his, he's in a different contractual situation. He now has to have a really good year this year to go back into the market next year and get the type of money he's looking for. He is incentivized to play ball in a way that he wasn't before. And I'll say that that is the key. Perk, you mentioned this, and that is absolutely the key. Is Harden, would Harden be bought into this concept? Because we know what happens when Harden is not bought in. 
We know he can make it miserable for his team, but this is a, an older Harden who has a, who's holding a different hand. One thing I'm going to point out about the Sixers, they have multiple paths they can go down. They certainly can go down the path of trying to trade Harden to the Clippers, collect assets and make a play for Dame Lillard or another player, another big name player that maybe we're not even thinking of right now. But they, or they could do this. They could try to talk James Harden into coming back and playing out his contract. His contract is not eligible for an extension, so there's no pressure on any more talks. There's no contract talks. They could hold on to Tobias Harris, who is um, at the last year of his contract, and they could just say, we're not going to do an extension there. And they have pretty much already made it known that, number one, they don't want to trade Tyrese Maxey, and number two, they don't want to extend him this summer. We saw a bunch of extensions from Tyrese Maxey's class, T uh, Tyrese Halliburton, LaMelo Ball, uh, Desmond Bain, we didn't see an extension for Maxi, and they've made it clear they're not going to do that. So they could wait until Maxi becomes a restricted free agent next summer. If they do that, they could open tens and tens of millions of salary cap space. They could run this team that they had back last year that wasn't um, you know, that far from a title, and they could open it up. And, and, I, and, and they've made moves this summer that has left that door open. They let... Uh, George Niang go away to Cleveland on a three-year contract. I don't think they wanted to give him a multi-year deal. They let Shake Milton, their backup, go to Minnesota on a two-year contract. When they signed Pat Beverly, so many contracts have been given out to minimum players this summer have been with two-year contracts with player options, not with Beverly. It was a one-year contract. They have left open an avenue where they could go and be a cap space team next summer and be a big swinger in that regard. Now, I don't know who they'd be going after. It's not a potentially attractive class, especially if you have a guy like Jalen Brown do a contract extension or Paul George do a contract extension or Kawhi Leonard do a contract extension. But that path, that path that is not trained, trade James Harden is there. All right, quick takes. Let's get it. Free agent guard Russell Westbrook has agreed on a new two-year $7.8 million deal to stay with the L.A. Clippers. Woj reported on Saturday, Perk, can the Clippers make noise in the West? Absolutely they can. It comes down to health. And, and kudos to Russell Westbrook for taking four, four, what, a little under about $4 million a year to stay with the Clippers. I thought he, he, went, he saved his career last season under Ty Lue. And look, we know how Paul George plays alongside Russell Westbrook. We've seen him play some of his best basketball in Oklahoma City, and now Russell Westbrook is that key and that engine that they need night in and night out to make sure that they stay in the thick of things in the Western Conference. All right, let's move over to the Eastern Conference. The Nova Knicks are in full effect as New York agreed to a four-year, $50 million contract with free agent guard Dante DiVincenzo, reuniting him with former Villanova teammates Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart. Wendy, will the Knicks take a step forward or back next season? Well, I think they've got a chance to take a step forward. First off, they're not necessarily done. Let's see what other moves they make. Now, they traded in OG Obi Toppin for a couple of second-round picks. That was kind of surprising that they gave up on him, but let's see what they can do with the rest of their roster. But they got Dante DiVincenzo to take less than the full mid-level. That was a nice signing. And not only that, Josh Hart opted into his contract, his former teammate at Villanova, and that maneuver helped the Knicks get this exception space to do it. It was incredible a sign of working with the front office that Josh Hart did to help bolster the team, and I think one of their next moves will be to extend Josh's Hart's contract now that he's opted in. Look, the Knicks have, they were the fifth place team during the regular season. They're not right there with those elite teams. What, what you look at the Knicks and get excited about is potential trade with all those assets. In the meantime, they're going to be competitive, but let's see when they make their big trade, whether it's this year or next summer. Yeah, that's at least a collegiate national uh, basketball team, so we'll see what they're able to do in New York. All right, free agent center Brooke Lopez is returning to the Milwaukee Bucks after agreeing to a two-year, $48 million deal, a source told ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski. Courtney, which was the most important signing? Well, I think when you look at Chris Middleton and what he provides from the mid-range game, like that's, you know, you can't lose that. I know that they didn't have the offense that they needed in the postseason, but imagine losing your second-best scorer and then realizing you have another hole that that you have to fill around Giannis. So some people might say retaining Chris Middleton is the big move, but frankly, I think it's Brooke Lopez. Look at how this contract is structured and what we're going to be talking about two months from now when Giannis can, you know, agree to an extension. The two-year deal that Brooke Lopez got, I think, is going to sync up nicely with this window of getting all of the supporting cast back in Milwaukee around Giannis, Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, 
Brooke Lopez, and they've got about a two-year window to, to operate in to win a championship here before people's contracts run out, player options, so on and so forth. But I really like the, the Middleton one's the big one, but the Brooke Lopez uh, deal of him getting back to Milwaukee is a sneaky good one because Giannis isn't going to want to play 60 games as a center next year. So yeah. like, let's, let's keep that in, in context here because – we have not talked about him much during this free agency process, as I mentioned, because that extension for him doesn't be, he's not extension eligible until a little bit later this offseason. But imagine if they didn't do those moves. Then what would we be talking about? Oh, is Giannis going here? Is he going to the Knicks? What name a destination to be named later? That would have been the conversation had Milwaukee not tried to retain two of their key guys that were up. Wendy, I, Wendy, sorry, I cut you off there, Courtney. Wendy, I want to ask you the same question because I heard you guys talking about this on the Hoop Collective before Brooke Lopez signed, re-signed with uh, the Bucks. So what do you think about this um, situation in Milwaukee? Yeah, to me, this is one of the biggest pieces of drama that happened over the first 24 hours of free agency because I'm not sure that the Bucks, with the, you know, they're in the repeater tax. Never in a million years when they dreamed up the concept of the repeater tax where you're paying six, seven, eight dollars per dollar over the tax lines that the Milwaukee Bucks would be in it. And trust me, their ownership never thought when they bought the team that they would be in it. And there was a real drama. Would Brooke Lopez take an offer sitting there from the Houston Rockets? They landed Fred Van Vliet and they had this big offer. They had 25 million left in cap room. And that's about what Brooke Lopez got. And he's a guy in his mid thirties. But the thing is you can't replace him. It's not like in football where a guy walks away and you have that salary slot. The way the NBA is structured, it just doesn't work that way. They could not afford to lose Brooke Lopez. And let's remind everybody the Bucs were the best team in the East of the regular season. They had five more wins than the Denver Nuggets. Now, look, in the playoffs, they, they laid an egg. Giannis got dinged up. Uh, Middleton was not back to where he needed to be. They got outplayed, not executed by the Miami Heat. It was extremely, di it was extremely disappointing, and they fired their championship head coach to, because of it, and they've got some work to do. But they, you know, until we see what Philadelphia and Boston and Miami finish with, because all of them uh, are still working right now, the, the, the Bucks when retaining these two players, are my favorite to be number one in the East again. Burke, yeah, uh, what I'm do you right think? There, okay. I'm right there with you. I'm doubling down with Wendy. They're my favorite as well because, I mean, the most important piece was Brooke Lopez. When, when it comes to the big man tandem, that four and five, I don't know if it's a better tandem in the NBA outside of Brooke Lopez and, and, uh, Brooke Lopez and Giannis when it comes down to what they bring on the defensive side of things and the way that they anchor the defense, Brooke Lopez is so underrated when it comes down to guarding the pick and roll. I love his ability of, of rim protection, obviously 7-1, 7-2, whatever the case may be. But on the offensive end, he give Giannis space. He give Giannis space to operate because you have to respect his three-point shooting. And if you need to throw it to him on a low block, he can get you a bucket, and his ability to get to the free throw line is underrated. Look, Chris Middleton, he was not healthy. Things were just not right for him last season. Now all of a sudden he get a full offseason to get his body right, to recover, to get his game back to where it was. And now we talk about that pick and roll with Giannis Antetokounmpo and Chris Middleton, that late game, two-man game that's so hard to stop going back into next season. Right now, I'm with Wendy. They're the heavy favorite and my favorite in the Eastern Conference. Who was most important for the Suns to make a deep playoff run? Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, or Bradley Beal? It's, yeah, it's Devin Booker. And I have to say, I have endless admiration for Kevin Durant, but Kevin Durant was brought to Phoenix to support Booker. And I think KD knows that. And certainly the way they played in the playoffs, it may not have been an ideal usage of the two of them because it was a lot of Booker and not as much Durant as you want. And that's one of the reasons why I think Monty Williams was let go because he didn't, you know, perfect what they needed. Um, but I definitely think that this is Booker's team. And and Bradley Beal came in last week and, and ratified that. He, he definitely feels that way. And look, Bradley Beal's got his money. Durant's got his money and got his titles. The guy who is, is at the centerpiece of this is Devin Booker. And if you watched him play uh, when, he, when he had Durant on the floor with him last year, particularly in those two rounds of playoffs, you would agree that, that he, is, he has got to be at the center of what the Suns do going forward. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that. I mean, it is Book's team, but the most important player on this team for us what they're trying to accomplish is Kevin Durant. Devin Booker had an opportunity to actually lead this Phoenix Suns organization to winning their first NBA championship, and he folded like a yoga mat in the finals to Giannis and lost four straight. When it comes down to KD, Bill, and Booker, we have to throw out the word sacrifice because somebody's going to have to sacrifice shot attempts somewhere because they're all not going to be able to get 25 shot attempts apiece. And we know Bradley Bill and Devin Booker, you know, Bradley Bill's right at the, in the middle of his prime, Devin Booker knocking at the door of starting his prime, and Kevin Durant is at the end of his prime. Not saying he's still not, is, not saying that he's not a great player, but KD, I'm looking forward to him as being that point forward piece, meaning the guy that's going to be bringing up the ball, the decision maker, running the offense because he can do it. So when I'm looking at KD, I'm actually, you know, calling him out and seeing if he could come forward and be the leader of that team, the vocal leader and the on the court leader, that ultimate floor general. So when I look at what Phoenix is trying to do, they went all in for us getting Bradley Bill. They, they have come out publicly saying, you know, that they are built to win the championship now, not tomorrow. So when I think about that, it's KD all day. KD is the only person with two championships and two finals MVPs, and he knows what it takes to get it done. It's remarkable, all of these pieces around Devin Booker. Back in 2018, he's the one who said he'd love to see a super team come to him and get built around him. So I guess ask and you shall receive. The Bradley Beal ingredient in all of this, like I know inconsistent play, some injuries the last two seasons might have people thinking, how does this actually move the needle in Phoenix? But you have somebody who's coming off of a season not too long ago where he averaged 31.3 points. He's a solid playmaker. It's another perimeter threat for a team that was so top-heavy in the postseason. Starters for the Phoenix Suns scored nearly 88% of their points in the postseason. Like, let that sink in when you think about, you know, what Brad Beal adds as far as his contributions here, being able to open things up for Kevin Durant and Devin Booker. So those two, as the stars of this team, are kind of pushed in that direction by their third star taking some of the load off of them. But it's the moves for me that the Phoenix Suns have executed in free agency. I really like this Eric Gordon move, and it's not just because I'm an Indiana grad. He's 20th all-time in three-pointers made. <laughs> the backup depth that you get there at the guard position is something that they lacked. And whether it's the minutes that Kevin Durant was forced into playing this year, around averaging around 42 in the postseason, we know, guys, that he can't continue at that clip entering this next season. And you don't want to put that on, on Devin Booker as well. So completing this trio with Devin with Bradley Beal and then they signed about six players in the first 90 minutes all on veteran minimum deals and that was before they ended up getting Eric Gordon who's always been on Phoenix's wish list I, I know I said that the Lakers won free agency and I still stand by that but the Phoenix Suns at least in the West are a very close second with the way that they ended up constructing the rest of this roster after getting Bradley Beal in the trade a couple weeks back uh, and, and to add to your point, this is going to be some of the m most fun offensive basketball we have ever witnessed. And, I, and I'm not throwing shade at Golden State because obviously watching them with Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, and Klay Thompson, they had their moments. This Phoenix Suns team is going to be must-see TV offensively. They have too much firepower and too many guys that are efficient, elite scorers when it comes down to book KD and uh, uh, Bradley Bill. We're looking at Kevin Durant. He shot 55% from the field last year. Devin Booker, 50%. Bradley Bill, 50%. Like, these guys are efficient, elite scorers in the game. It's going to be fun. And I'm and look, here's another thing that people have to realize. Frank Vogel is a hell of a coach. I know things didn't end well in L.A., but they did win a championship there. And when you look at how he left his mark, when he was in Indiana, when they was with Paul George and Roy Hibbert and they was running against those Heat teams, Frank Vogel can coach his behind off. He's going to put in a defense that is going to be great. He's going to get the best out of DeAndre Jordan. This Phoenix Suns team is going to be a force to be reckoned with. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.